All right, I'm in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Gospel of John, chapter 17. I'm going to spend a little bit more time between verses 2 and 3, uh, mainly just kind of focusing on 3 in a sense. But this is more of a follow-up message to the previous one uh, with regards to God choosing certain people to be in his life. And this has to do with other people making choices about whether they want to have God in their lives as well, that there has to be a mutual agreement of some kind, all right? Uh, now, in verse 2, in John chapter 17, verse 2, it says, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. All right, all these he's and you's, I spent time in the previous message talking about these pronouns in a sense, and that this is these are just abstractions in order to come to a conclusion. But this is the Lord Jesus praying. It is Jesus functioning as a man, and as you would expect a man to do, he will have a conversation or talk to or present things to his God. And so this is the Lord praying, or what I would like to refer to as the Lord's prayer. However, I don't do that so often because it can be confusing with what most people will think of when they hear the phrase, the Lord's prayer, as it's referring to how he told us, you know, this is how you ought to pray in the context of the old covenant in order to facilitate uh, a person discovering that they have no hope outside of the grace and mercy of God to have a relationship with their God, all right? And so there is this aspect of God giving people to himself, this aspect of him giving people to himself. I spoke a little bit about this in the previous message, that he does this by presenting the criteria, the, the definition through which a person can be saved. And a big part of this is that these are people who are going to need, need to know, or they're going to have to want to know their God as a person. In verse 3, Jesus describes eternal life as knowing your God. You know, that this is eternal life. It is knowing your God and the one who he had sent. And that's a summary of a big package of explanations and details. And that to God, this is a way of understanding eternal life, you know? And, and so if this is a way of understanding eternal life and, and relating to God, then those who do not want to know their God will probably not have a place with him. You know, you probably could relate to this in some ways, you have people in your life and, and of the people who are in your life, can you identify a few maybe who have an interest in knowing you? You know, I mean, do you have anybody? You may not have anybody. And if you don't, don't feel alone in this regard. <laughs> There's lots of people who, who have lives that are like this, that they, had, they just don't really have anybody in their life who genuinely wants to know them as a person. But, you know, of those who don't, they're pretty easy to spot. You can identify those people easily by thinking about them and, and the way that they relate to you. And you'll eventually figure out, you know, this person just has no interest in knowing me as a person at all. They're really in my life for other reasons. Now, think about these people. Do you want these people to be in your life for all eternity? You know, do you really? You know, I may you may be okay with them being in your life for, you know, a short while uh, or, you know, maybe a, until you're physically dead, perhaps. There, there may be some opportunities for that, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you have somebody in your life in that respect. But my point is, is that it's unlikely that you're going to want this person to be in your life forever. You know, it's unlikely. Now, they may want you to be in their life forever for other reasons. And that's the point, is it for other reasons besides knowing you, okay? And so what God has done is he has structured the gospel and he's structured his kingdom in heaven. 
and he has made himself available only to a limited extent. And in the way that he has done all of this, he in effect protects himself, all right, and the kingdom of heaven from people who don't want to know him. You know, I gave the example of how people look at eternal life in the previous message. I spoke about the idea that, that, that most people are thinking that to go to heaven means that you get your, you get your real estate, you know, you, you get your, your mansion, your home, whatever it may be, and it's going to be uh, in the way that, that, that God uh, recognizes that you desire. You know, this is a perspective that's quite common. And when you get there, you know, that's where you're going to be able to hang out. That's going to be your place. And God will probably provide you with some angelic servants who will assist and make sure that you have anything and everything that you could potentially desire. All right. Having a relationship with God, ah, that's irrelevant. All right. And you might find that surprising that people would relate to him that way. But, you know, I have encountered more than enough people in order to say that this is common. You know, this is common, that this is the kind of attitude. And I proposed in the previous message, is, you know, is, is God really going to allow these kinds of people to be in his life, to be in his kingdom? And again, it's, uh, you know, we're all fortunate that I'm not the one who makes these, these decisions. He will make the right decision concerning these things. But I wonder, you know, I wonder, is he really? You know, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, will, will he allow the, those kinds of people to be in his, present, in his presence? So what you've got is you've got a God who has presented himself to the world that he has created. He has presented the truth. He's presented criteria. He's presented definitions. He's presented opportunities. But only some people are going to respond to that. Some people who will respond who are the kinds of people that he really wants. He will make a division in the world between the lost and the saved. There is a division. There will be people who will be in his kingdom and be with him forever. And there are a lot of other people who are going to be sent to the place of the forgotten, you know, where, where they would just be forgotten. They will not be remembered anymore. All right. You know, they're just simply not going to be remembered. They're going to be forgotten. And, you know, it's hard for people to accept that, that God would just forget you. <laughs> you know, would just, ah, you know, who are they? You know, if I remember them still vaguely, don't worry, just wait a little while longer, you know. We'll just wait a little while longer into eternity. And after more time passes, we'll forget them more and more and more. All right, that's another way to consider it. But it's important to remember that people have these different views of what eternal life is. And, you know, it just so happens that a lot of these views can have some distortions in them that just simply are not real. They're just what people want it to be, what people desire heaven to be like, eternal life to be like. They have a desire of the kind of God that they want in their life. But, you know, this God probably doesn't exist. The God, this God does not exist if he does not conform to the one who has revealed himself in a way that we have documentation concerning what he said and what he did and what's important to him. Knowing him is important to him. All right. This is important. He wants people who know him and they know him because they want to know him. If you don't want to know him, he has provided many ways out so that you don't have to. All right, now you can ask people the question, you know, what does eternal life mean to you? I've asked this question. It's, it's a reasonable question. How would you describe eternal life? What, is, what does that really mean to you in your mind? And I gave you one example that, well, it means I have a place where I can hang out for all eternity and have angelic servants. You know, that's, that's one way. And, you know, there are a lot of people who have that belief, 
have that perspective, but they just don't want to say it that way. All right. They, you know, I'm just saying it just outright. I'm just telling you this is what a lot of people are thinking. But that no, they're not going to they're not going to admit that. All right? They're not going to confess that this is what they really think, because then it would be obvious that this is uh, not appropriate. And it's going to be obvious that, uh, it, you know, that God may not provide them with that. All right. Eternal life to some people just means, well, I'm just going to live forever. And they don't know what that's going to look like or what that's going to be about or what, you know, what they're going to do, <laughs> or what that's going to be, what that represents. And they don't need to, you know, that's fine. Oh, I'm just going to live forever. You know, well, okay, you know, good. That's, that's, that's a reasonable definition. I, sp I reminded you in the previous message that another way to define and understand eternal life has to do with the life of God that dwells within you eternally. All right. And this represents something a little bit more that eternal life has to do with living right now and that the experience in the kingdom of heaven is an extension, an eternal extension of the present experience of eternal life right now. You know, that is another way to look at it. That is not so much or it's not only. It's not only about how does God get us out of hell and into heaven. It's also about how does God get himself out of heaven and into us, you know? And this is, this is a temporary experience because eventually we're going to go to heaven and then things are different. But this is a, this is a part of eternal life, the eternal life package. You know, there are, there are many parts to understanding what eternal life is and what it is about. You know, other people think of eternal life as it is going to be the eternal praise and worship service. This is a common answer that I've gotten. It's the eternal praise and worship service. You know, we're just going to go there and we're going to sing to God forever. You know, and you know, if that's what you'd like to do, I'm sure God will accommodate that and make a provision. You know, I don't think that that's a bad thing, you know, and I and, and while I think that there is so much more that can be experienced, it could be that after a while people would explore the additional things, you know, besides just the eternal praise and worship service. OK, so there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more to discover. And here in verse three, Jesus expresses the fact that knowing him is an important part as it relates to this. OK, verse three, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay, now I'd like to speak a little bit more about how God makes a division between those who are going to have eternal life and those who will not. Because there is a division, okay? And in the previous message, I mentioned that this does have a lot to do with the willful, voluntary decision that people make. Okay. Now you probably have noticed that most of the people who are in the world have made a decision to not embrace an eternal life. You know, most of the people in the world, they just reject that. And, and, and that's, you know, that's just the way things go. But I want to tell you a little bit about the obstacles that they have to overcome in many cases in order to embrace eternal life. All right, because there are some obstacles that everyone ends up facing. And these obstacles are the obstacles that people will struggle with, regardless of what they are. These obstacles that people have to overcome in order to embrace their God and, and embrace eternal life, these obstacles are good, okay, because they really do put people into a situation that they really have to decide that they want to be in God's life. They have to really decide that they want God to be in their lives, you know, and this is a God of truth. You know, it, it, just, just consider that, that a person has to decide that the truth is more important to them than other things. It might take precedence. 
You know, this represents the decisions that people make and to have the obstacles of life that people have to overcome in order to embrace the the gospel, surrender to the new covenant, pursue a relationship with God. These obstacles filter out those people who God does not want in his life. And, you know, it, it filters out the, the people who should not really have a place in the kingdom of heaven, you know, just because they are not the kinds of people that God wants. And, you know, God gets to decide who he wants in his life. That just might sound a little bit unfair to you, maybe, or a little bit awkward to you, because maybe you're not used to that with the relationships you have with other people. You know, that the relationships you have with other people are, are, are existing because there's some kind of force implied through these kinds of relationships. But you know, with God, you're not going to be able to do that. He's not a God who could be forced into having a relationship with people. He's not the kind of person who can be who can be manipulated or deceived, you know. And so just stand alone. Think about that. You know, you know, people who are not going to want to have a relationship with anyone that they cannot manipulate or deceive or force into doing this or that. All right. And so so this is an obstacle that people have to overcome. And there are very few people who overcome these obstacles to the point where they will be able to embrace this God, you know? So so there will be very few people who will be a part of the kingdom of heaven, but who God gets are going to be the kinds of people that he wants, all right? He's going to get the kinds of people that he wants. If you want to be one of those people, then you're going to have to make some choices. You're going to have to make some decisions. And it's probable that you're going to have to give up a lot in order to be that kind of person, to decide that that's who you will be. And this is difficult for a lot of folks because they don't want to have personal responsibility for who they are, for what they value. All right, they, they just don't. Instead, it's more important to them to just declare something like, well, this is just the way I am. You know, this is just the way I am. And if God does not accept the way that I am, well, then he's, he's evil. You know, he's evil. <laughs> this is the attitude that people have. You know, they probably relate to you that way. You know, if you do not accept the way that a person is, Well, then they are a victim. You know, you have victimized them. You are an abuser. You are evil because you don't accept them just the way they are. Even though the way they are is abusive, disrespectful, (laughs) and and, and manipulative and dishonest. You don't don't tolerate that. (laughs) You don't. You know, and this is a real struggle. All right. These people who are like that, they have to decide to let those things go. And, and if, they, if they don't, you know, to become someone else, you know, I mean, that's what it means to be born again by the Spirit, to be made into a child of God. It has to do with becoming someone else. You have to recognize that who you are is not who you want to be. You know, are you going to grow and mature and change in the Lord Jesus, in, in, in the living God and the new covenant? Are you going to experience, you have to recognize that who you are is not who you want to be. And a lot of this has to do with intentional decisions. It's not just some, some abstract declaration. Well, this is the way I am and God had better accept it or he's victimizing me, you know, I mean, and that's how people relate to each other in the world. It's everywhere. Okay. With all kinds of different bizarre things that people really want to embrace for themselves. Okay, so there are some obstacles to overcome. Now, let me let me approach this differently in order to to kind of give you a a different perspective concerning these obstacles. All right. Another way to look at this is to talk about uh, the, the problems that everybody has to solve in life. You know, life is about solving problems. 
and there are a set of problems that everybody needs to solve in one way or another. For example, you could look at this from the perspective of the needs to sustain life, food, shelter, clothing, energy. That's, that's a reasonable summary just to start with, that there is a need for these things and these are problems that have to be solved. Okay, now how do people experience this in the beginning of their life? Let's just go all the way to the beginning and start with a little baby, you know, just, just to have a place to start. You start out as a little baby and, you know, of course, these are problems that have to be solved. And you're not going to be able to solve these problems. Babies don't solve these kinds of problems. All right. Well, they solve them, but they, they, they require other people to solve these problems for them. For example, when it comes to food, you know, when it comes to eating, it won't be very long before a baby discovers the discomfort of hunger. You know, that usually doesn't take very long. Eventually, they experience this sense of discomfort. And so what do they do in order to solve the problem of hunger and the discomfort associated with it? Well, what they generally do is cry. You know, they just start crying. And when they do, somehow, spontaneously even, miraculously perhaps, food just appears in front of their mouth or just, just gets put in their mouth, you know? Right? It just happens. And so the baby discovers after, you know, after a short period of time that this is how you solve the problem of hunger. If you're hungry, you just cry and scream. And eventually somebody is going to give you food. All right. And, you know, this this is appropriate. This is acceptable. But, you know, one day. One day, they're going to have to change the way that they solve that problem. You know, you're not going to be able to, as, as, as a child or as an adult necessarily, you're not going to necessarily be able to solve that problem just by crying and screaming and declaring that you're hungry. And that is how this problem is going to get solved. Somebody around you, you know, somebody in your presence, usually an adult, is going to to provide you with food. And so that's how you solve the problem of hunger. You just cry. <laughs> you know? Eventually, you're going to have to change this a little bit. And, and people do. You know, they change. And there are adult versions of crying and screaming in order to get, vo- to get food. There are, you know, there, there are more sophisticated approaches and methods in order to solve that problem. But when it comes down to it, it still is the same solution model of just crying and screaming. All right. That's how it is for a lot of people. So they don't really overcome uh, this issue. They don't learn how to solve this problem in more constructive ways. And well, you know, if they have people in their lives who will feed them under these conditions, then you could suggest that it is the fault of the people who provide them with food, you know, that they are enabling this dysfunctional problem solving technique, you know, and, and that's just an exaggerated example in order to show you that there are problems that people will have to overcome in order to assume personal responsibility for themselves. Okay, because the problem solving techniques that people learn in order to solve the problems of life early on Those techniques that they learn are really all about how do I get someone else to solve these problems for me? When and how will it happen that they will be confronted in a way that they will realize that they have to change their approach and and, and solve these kinds of problems for themselves to assume personal responsibility instead of trying to find ways to get other people to be responsible for them. Okay, these are obstacles and challenges that everyone is faced with. 
you know, and it turns out that a lot of people can find ways to live their lives doing nothing but living off of the labor of somebody else and making somebody else responsible to provide them with the things that they require in order to sustain their lives. Okay, and I'm not saying that this is always bad. I'm just saying that these things can become obstacles that will prevent a person from embracing their God because to embrace your God and to surrender to the gospel, you have to embrace personal responsibility. All right, you just have to. God is, you know, God has defined the gospel in that context. Okay, now there are other things. For example, when babies grow up a little bit, they become toddlers or children. There's going to be some situation. It's going to happen. You know, there's going to be some situation where they are confronted with something. You know, a problem will exist. Something will happen. And the way that they will solve this, this issue, is with dishonesty. Okay, they will lie. For example, you'll ask a, you'll ask a child or a kid, did you do this? And they'll say, no. <laughs> All right, you know, but they did. Okay, or did you mean this? No, I didn't mean that, no. <laughs> but they did. Okay, dishonesty, telling lies, is a problem-solving technique, you know? And if, and if a person is confronted with something, and they realize that, well, if I can just lie my way out of this, it'll be a lot easier than facing the truth and making adjustments and dealing with the consequences related to that. If being dishonest is easier and it doesn't cost them anything, they just tell a lie, you know? So if it doesn't work, eh, that's no big deal, right? You know, it doesn't. So now they have to deal with the real consequences. So to them, there's a preference, okay, that, that people are gonna be confronted with. There will be a preference to be dishonest as the initial problem solving technique. And if it works, hey, you know, you're done. If it doesn't work, okay, then you have to assume some personal responsibility and make some adjustments from there, all right? And then there's other things. There's other ways that people will solve the problems of life. They use manipulations, manipulations, okay? To, to be dishonest in, in some ways that will cause someone else to do something for them, you know, there could be the implied promise that they will do something in return, for example, that they will be a participant in solving the other problems of life, you know, and that working together, these two people, one person will solve this, the other person will solve that, and, and through working together, there will be an increase in the quality of life because we're sharing the burden of solving the problems of life. But then the person doesn't follow through. And they don't do their part. You know, this fits into the category of manipulations. And there are lots and lots, there's an abundance, it seems, of different ways to solve problems and issues through manipulations. Turning oneself into a victim, for example, is a manipulation. It is a problem solving technique. I want these people to do these things for me. And so I'm going to be really nice to them. You know, I'm going to do things for them. I'm going to give things to them. And the more that I do for them and the more that I'm nice to them, if they do not do these other things for me in return, well, then I'm a victim. <laughs> and so, you know, they feel the pressure of doing things for, you know, uh, 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 they feel the pressure of these things being done for them because what, if, what, what is effectively happening is that the manipulator is putting someone in debt, all right? They're putting someone in debt and boy, they had better pay at some point. You know, this, this is experienced by some people. Uh, for example, you may be able to recognize this. Sometimes you feel uncomfortable when somebody offers to do something for you, you know, offers to help you out, you feel uncomfortable about that sometimes, some people, because you just get that feeling deep down inside that if you let this person do this, you're gonna owe them. You know, they're doing you a favor, you're gonna owe them a favor. And you know, you just may not wanna have to pay a favor later. They're not doing this for you 
because they genuinely want to. It's not a gift. It's debt. You know, you're being put into debt and they're going to come by someday, someday later wanting to collect, you know, and, and you just may not have a life that allows for you to be able to take the time or the effort or the energy or whatever is going to be required in order to pay those debts. So no, don't help me. Stay out of my life. Don't be of help, you know, because you're going to you're going to put me in debt. This is how people will respond because they sense that in many cases, these are manipulations. You know, they just are. This is the way that people relate to others in order to obtain something in the future by giving something now. You know, it's not really a gift. It's, 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 it's now you're going to owe me and don't worry. I want you to owe me and I don't want you to pay up now because one day later I'm going to need something. And this is how I'm going to get those things that I need in the future. I'm going to say that I'm now collecting the debt that you owe me. And, and, you know, these don't, th these are not, these are not formal contracts. You know, they're not formal agreements that are written down and are defined and the people sign in order to say, okay, I agree to that. No, it's an open-ended, open-ended debt. It's just whatever, you know, whatever. We're going to come collect whatever, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and these are struggles, okay? These are struggles, but this is how people will solve the problems of life. And they will want a God who they can relate to in that way. You know, I'm going to do some works. Yes, I'm going to work for God. And he is going to owe me. You know, they try to put God in debt by their religious efforts, by the tithes that they give, by the worship that they give, by the good works that they do. It's a manipulation. It's a problem-solving technique that people learn early on, you know, and it's a form of dishonesty because you're not making it clear that you're going to collect later. You just show up later and demand collection, <laughs> demand, demand payment. And, and, and this is how people approach their lives and how they approach and how they build relationships with other people. And a lot of it has the premise of living off of the labor of somebody else. And it has to do with debt collection experiences in the future, you know, and this is how people will relate to God. That's how people relate to God in the context of rewards, for example, whereas they feel that going to heaven is a debt collection experience to get those rewards, the compensation for what God should have blessed you with when you were here on earth. You know, there are, they don't want to say that, you know, people don't want to admit that this is really how they relate to the Lord. And, you know, I don't think that God is going to allow people in his life who relate to him that way. Okay. Most of this can be distilled down to the element of refusing to embrace personal responsibility. Okay. Now, there are other aspects to this. For example, uh, I, I, I gave the example earlier of a person who will say, no, I didn't do something when they did. You know, this happens a lot when it comes to violating somebody else. If you insult somebody else, if you cause harm to someone else, if you deceive or lied to somebody, if you, if you cause physical harm, physical damage, you know, or damage to their property, there, there's different ways that this can be, you know, this can be done where you violate or you sin against another person. So how do people solve this problem? They refuse to admit that they did it. They say, listen, you know, if, if you really want to confront me over this, you're going to have to prove without question that I did this, you know, or that I'm responsible for this, or that I sinned against you. You know, they, they simply start with that. They start with dishonesty, with the, you know, the demand that this be shown in a court of law, perhaps, you know, is, is that really how, how you want to have a relationship with somebody? The relationship with somebody is defined by a court of law. You know, that's not how you have a relationship with somebody. That's how you end relationships with people. OK, because force, force is not uh, an appropriate way to have a relationship with another person. That, that's just not appropriate. But that's what that involves. That's what that represents. 
And most people will solve the problems of life by saying, I will never admit any of anything until I am forced to admit. And I will never compensate someone for the violations that I engaged in unless I'm forced to. You know, and, 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 and so how does this problem keep a person from embracing their God? Well, if, if you're not going to admit that you have sinned, if you're not going to confess that, that you have violated others or even your God, then how are you going to really embrace the forgiveness that he has presented? You know, there is, there, there needs to be some compatibility. You know, in this case, there is incompatibility. There is no compatibility between a God who offers forgiveness and a person who refuses to acknowledge that they have a need for forgiveness or, in effect, that they have violated anyone, you know? And so th these are ways that God divides between those who are going to be in his life and those who are not. You know, a person, you eventually, you have to come to a point where you're going to decide that the truth is more important to you than lying or to live in the lie in order to solve the problems of life. You're going to have to decide. This is a willful, voluntary decision that a person makes that they're going to value the truth more, that they are going to put aside manipulations, dishonesty. They're going to decide. You have to decide that this is going to be who you are and what you are about because you have to confess your sin and you have to turn away from this. This is the context of repentance, to turn away and never look back. You know, and, and of course, there are adjustments that people have to make in order to get to this. And we have a patient God who recognizes that people have to grow and change and mature over time. But there is a threshold of some kind. There exists a threshold that God requires. And he doesn't tell us what that is. This is for him. That he re There's a threshold that he requires that a person decides to turn to him in the context of, I want to live in the truth and I want to know the truth. And I know that God is the definer of what is true. And I want to have a relationship with him because he is the one who's going to guide me and lead me into all truth. And I want to solve the problems of life correctly or in a healthy and constructive way. And I believe that he is the one who, you know, the one who has created the world and created life to begin with, he is the one who will guide me and lead me into the proper problem-solving techniques of life, all right? And when a person makes this decision that that's what they're going to pursue, you have a God who will open his arms and say, yes, you are now the kind of person who I want in my life. You once were the kind of person who I definitely needed to protect myself from and my kingdom from. We can't let people like you in there, all right? But now you are the kind of person who we want in our lives. That's this is an abstraction of God speaking. And that God would say, you are now, now you are the kind of person who he wants, the kind of person who he has chosen, the kind of person, all right? He reaches out to the collective. I mentioned this in the previous message, and it is the individuals who respond to what he has offered, to what he has presented. And it really does require a person who will embrace personal responsibility for themselves, reach out to their God and say, please guide me, please lead me, please make changes in me. I want to be a different person than who I am. Please show me the truth. Show me what is real and show me who you are. I want to know you because knowing you is in effect more important than me just being consumed with myself and me just being focused on just what it is that I need 
You know, and how am I going to solve the problems of life easier and more inappropriately, whatever it may be? This is a way that God makes a division in the world, all right? And so those who want to know him are those who he will embrace and give eternal life to. This is eternal life. It is knowing your God and the one who he has sent. All right. So that's um, how I'm going to approach uh, this topic. And for those of you who are using uh, these messages for, for your small groups, I have a question for you that can facilitate some discussion. Uh, what has God showed you about better ways to solve the problems of life? You know, I mean, what has God showed you personally? You have problems in your life. You have had problems that you've been confronted with. But has he shown you some different ways to solve the problems of life that, that you were not doing before? And because of the revelation of God, you live differently. You are a different person because you have embraced what God has shown you about how to live and about how to interact with others and about how to, to work through the issues that you that everyone is faced with, but that you specifically, some examples maybe that you have been faced with, that you you did things differently because, because you knew that this was what God wanted you to do, or that this is what God revealed to you about how you should approach things. So maybe there are some examples of that that uh, that are in your life, or maybe you can consider some of the things that you're dealing with right now, and how would God perhaps want you to solve them differently? than how you are right now. Those are individual situations and, and, and are unique. <clears throat> and, um, and, and for the most part, a person has to, has to be connected with their God personally. It's easy for, for everyone else to give opinions and advice on, well, you should do it this way. The word of God says this, you know, that kind of thing. But it's, it, it's not the same as a person hearing from the Lord themselves with respect to their own unique personal circumstances and for the Lord to reveal something to them, that's different, you know, and, 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 and that needs to be allowed. And if he doesn't show any, if he doesn't show anything, if he doesn't reveal anything, then you just wait until he does or you make the best decision that you can with what you have. All right, so I think it's a reasonable discussion question in order to get things kind of started in your small groups. And I will continue into the Lord's Prayer in the next message. Thanks.